Thank you so much. Uh, Rohini, maybe you could just start coming up. Uh, this was even actually better than I expected, because what happened now was more or less in Colin Warner's introduction, he introduced the next speaker. He introduced also the meso level, the intermediary level, the importance of organization, the importance of group dynamics, and the importance of, you know, how does equality and inequality play out among groups? And our next speaker, who is sitting here, you should just come up, <laughs> is Professor Rohini Somanathan from New Delhi Business School, but also, I've been told, and I'm happy to say so, a visiting scholar at the business, or part of the visiting scholar program at the University of Gothenburg and the business school there. Uh, she's asked Kalle and asked the next speaker, a prolific writer and a prolific speaker, and I, just last night, was able to read some of your work very quickly, and it is it's really a fantastic follow-up, both, I'm promising now just what's coming, but I know because I've seen it, it's a follow-up of this conversation. We're now moving with more in, you know, to the sort of my level in between, how the difference between groups. Same, the floor is yours. You can post questions, I will read them up, and uh, you, as you can see, you get answers, even affirmative answers. So, the floor is yours, Rehini. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you to the organizers. I'm very pleased to be here, um, especially because I think that many of the questions that we are dealing with across the social science disciplines and even as individuals and citizens are hard and I think they need interdisciplinary contact. And so I've picked something that I've been thinking about and struggling with uh, for some years now. Uh, not as many as Kalle, but a few. Um, and I'm going to talk about the measurement of social difference. Uh, a lot of work in the social sciences, and since about the late 90s, I would say, in economics, has started to talk about groups. So we talked a lot about inequalities, starting with the end of the Second World War, and then we've become more and more interested in talking about groups. And so our vocabulary has changed. On the left, you have some maybe more positive words about, the, about groups and, and group interactions. On the right, maybe some more negative ones. But these words have become increasingly used in the social science vocabulary and particularly in economics. So what I did was go to Google Ngram. I don't know if any of you have used this. You can put in words and you can look at their frequency in the entire corpus of Google Books. And you find here that, for example, if I take Lorenz curve, which is a measure of inequality, and I take ethno-linguistic fractionalization, which is a measure of fragment, group fragmentation in societies, then you find that they were pretty similar. The trends were pretty similar. They got used more and more in the 60s and 70s. Then, more recently, since the 90s, the Lorenz curve frequency has gone down, the ethno-linguistic fractionalization frequency has gone up. And this is in the entire English language. It's not, not within academics, it's not within economics. So why do we care so much about groups? And for two very important reasons. One is we want to understand whether these promises, these constitutional promises of equal treatment have really been kept. Uh, was it an eye wash or have people really become more equal? And then what we want to do when we ask that question is to look at groups that are historically disadvantaged through slavery, ostracism, or geographic or linguistic isolation, and we want to see whether there's been any convergence, whether they've caught up at all. So that's the normative question we're interested in. We're also interested in groups to understand cooperation and conflict. And here we look for groups, the way we define groups is that there is strong identity within groups, there's distances between them, and perhaps alienation and rivalry. So those are the kinds of criteria people use when they're deciding on what is a group. So here, what I'm going to do is state and then question three or four common pre premises. Um, so when we talk about groups and when people come up with measures of groups, the assumption is that these are sort of out there, that it's a natural, it's a natural demarcation. 
what is and is not a group is somehow obvious. Uh, and whether or not someone is part of a group is not something that is actively chosen, rather it's something that they are born into. Like you have a parent, you have a group. <laughs> and so uh, the first premise is that identity is inherited and it's not chosen, uh, and it's primarily ethnic, broadly defined. So language, religion, caste, race. The other premise is that heterogeneity is a disadvantage. So when you look at heterogeneous populations, a lot of people have said that Scandinavia is successful because it's been relatively homogeneous over long periods of time. Um, there's a lot of work now in Africa, in the United States, that looks at heterogeneity and says that, well, these communities are worse at providing public goods. So the other premise in the literature is that heterogeneity is a disadvantage. You need to manage it. So you might get more talented people coming in, but there's also dissonance, and you need to manage that dissonance somehow. Uh, that groups do not share common goals. The third premise, which is most of the talk today, uh, the first two really set the motivation and the backdrop. The third premise is that social data is comparable over time and space. So if we look at how heterogeneous a society is today and we look at how heterogeneous it was using the data that was available 20 or 30 years ago, we can get a good sense of how heterogeneity has changed. So that's what I really want to question here. Um, and I'm going to give you lots of detail that I was surprised when I looked at to, to convince me of this. Lastly, that relative group shares. Suppose we have defined groups in some kind of an acceptable way. The last premise is that relative group shares are going to measure societal propensity for conflict and cooperation. So those are the things that I'd like to question. And I have three claims. The first is that social data, the most important thing for today's presentation is real, that social data is rarely comparable. And it's worth studying the political and ideological influences that shape these data. The second is that identity is fluid and it responds to incentives. So the same person will report different identities in different contexts. And that these identities are not just idiosyncratically different, they're different in a way that responds to economic incentives. So I want to show you some evidence on that. The last point, which I hope I'll get to, and otherwise we'll touch upon very briefly, is that when we study group inequality and collective action, there's really a lot to be gained from merging what we used to do with what we do now. <laughs> so bringing the study of income to the study of groups and understanding the dynamics not only of income and groups, but also of technology and group inequality. So there's a lot to be gained of moving, taking a step back uh, and really thinking about the insights that we had from the study of inequality and then bringing them to the study of social interactions. So let's see how far I go. Um, so I'll start by giving you a brief history. I call this the categories of difference. I'm going to give you a brief history of social data collection in different countries and talk a little bit more about India. Um, I'll talk about the measures that are used with these social data to construct measures of heterogeneity, polarization, fractionalization. These are all things that have become popular in the social science literature. Then I'll give you some evidence on shifting identities. Uh, what evidence do we have that A, the same people report different identities in different contexts, Two, that those identities are actually manipulable and they respond to incentives. Uh, and lastly, this combining class and groups. And I might not get there. <laughs> In which case, it's, it's there for later. Um, so just to give you a sense of cross-national variation in data collection. So the United States Statistical Division has archives of census forms and census data. So we can look across countries and say which country collected what kind of data. So 138 countries around the year 2000 had a census. Uh, 87 of them collected some ethnic information. So 
collected nationality. This was mainly in Europe. 15% collected data on indigenous origin. And many of the former slaveholding societies connected data on race. India collected data on caste and tribe for disadvantaged groups, and it collected data on language and religion for everyone. Okay? And what I want to do is look at some of these countries in a little more detail and show you that the differences we see in the ways in which data are classified are partly a result of demographics. Obviously, you don't collect data on something that's not there at all. Right? But it also really reflects politics and the ideology within certain kinds of political systems. So let's get started. Let's start with the United States, which has the first census uh, in, 19, in 1790. And in that census, it basically counted people who were to be taxed and who were to be represented. So if you were not taxed, like the Native Americans, or if you didn't have full representation like slaves, then you were counted at different rates. You were not counted as a whole person, you were counted as part of a person. So that happened in 1790. In 1850, the word color appeared in censuses and you had blacks, whites, and a category called mulattoes. Race appeared for the first time in 1870 with an, as an explicit question and here, you saw the emergence of race science. So instructions were given to enumerators, be particularly careful in reporting the class mulatto. The word here has, is generic and includes quadroons, octroons, and all persons having any perceptible trace of African blood. So you can see the science, race science come in here. Basically, you had a different category depending on your proportion of African blood. Early 20th century, you had, this is very atypical for most censuses, but in the US census, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Mexican, Hindu, Cuban, all of these came under the race question. So you could report any of this, these things as a race. Okay. 1970, you started to have self-reported categories. So it wasn't some enumerator that came in and decided what you were. You could report who you were. Uh, but race and ethnicity were separate questions. In 1997, there was a federal directive to increase the number of categories. And people could respond not just by one category, but they could tick multiple options. Um, and so there's this famous opera show in 1997 where Tiger Woods talks about being bothered when he was called African American growing up. And he said... He invented this word, which is Cablinasian, Caucasian, Black, Indian, and Asian, because he had all of these in his ancestry and parentage. Um, so his father was half Black, uh, a quarter American Indian, one quarter Chinese. His mother uh, was half Thai, one quarter Chinese, and so on. <laughs> all right. Okay. Now let's take Canada which doesn't have a very different history of immigration, but a very, very different history of social data collection. So in Canada, the census before 1951 asked about race. In 1951, ethnic origin replaced the race question, and Canadian was a possible response. So you were allowed to say you were Canadian, but when the census tabulated data, it never reported this. All right. 1986, for the first time, they actually tabulated Canadian responses, and only half a percent reported being Canadian. In 1996, people suddenly saw, oh, that other people did report themselves Canadian, and you got one-third of the population reporting Canadian as their main ethnicity. Obviously, the population didn't change very much, but their notion of who they are changed dramatically. Uh, and then Canada experimented with ordering ethnicity options differently. French sometimes appeared before English, sometimes after English. Okay. In 2011, Canada has made ethnicity completely voluntary, so you can fill out the ethnicity questionnaire or you need not if you don't want to. Okay. And so that's going to have implications with how we look at these data. If you look at Europe, Many European countries, partly due to anti-Semitism and conflict, prohibited the collection of ethnic data. 
And more recently, the European Parliament has suggested that the lack of these data may hinder anti-discrimination policies because you don't observe ethnic gaps when they exist. Um, so you have a study of 41 countries in Europe, 22 collect data on ethnicity and nationality, 23 collect data on religion, 26 record mother tongue. Okay, and you can go on. Latin America, uh, Africa, so Rwanda, for example, prohibits collecting ethnic data on Tutsis and uh, Hutus and Tutsis. Uh, but of course, that's a relevant social divide. So the point that I'm trying to make here really is that what you look at when you look at measures of heterogeneity, so suppose someone does a cross-country study and takes different countries and says, well, let's look at whether there was conflict or not, and let's look at how much heterogeneity there was. Well, what they're going to find is not some primitive heterogeneity. They're going to find really the result of all of these census operations that have sometimes grouped people together, sometimes put them apart. Okay. And so we are, what you're finding is really the result of that, but we rarely realize that that's what we, what we are looking at. Uh, we look at some kind of a correlation. And, and I was frustrated with this for many years because we were looking, I was looking at this literature on heterogeneity in public goods. So people used measures of heterogeneity to look at whether parents were contributing to schools, whether there was conflict, whether there was civil war. They were using them for all these different things. And then they were reporting these negative correlations. And then I started looking at these heterogeneity measures in India, and I found there wasn't really anything going on. I couldn't see anything. And then I started to realize that, look, I think there is some bias here. You tend to report a coefficient when it's negative. You get a lot of insignificant coefficients that you don't report because you have some kind of a story on whether heterogeneity should matter, and you don't have a story on it not mattering. <laughs> and so, so I started to look at these data more carefully. Uh, so I don't know how I'm doing for time, Lisa. I'm just, I don't know how much to spend on India. Okay, so then, okay, all right. Okay, so, so basically what happened in India is similar in the sense that in British India, uh, the colonial state was obsessed with caste for some reason or the other. It was the most novel thing in the country that they went to. And so they were obsessed with caste. And the first censuses were ambivalent about caste. And then as you went through the colonial period, you collected more and more data on caste. So if you look, for example, at the 1901 census, then the caste chapter is the largest chapter. You don't have much on how much land inequality there is, how much income inequality or consumption inequality. You have nothing, but you have a lot of data on caste. And so what happened by the time we came to independence is you had this whole body on caste counts, but you had very little data on anything else. And so a lot of the policies for social redistribution became centered on caste, not partic particularly because it was the biggest divide, but really because it, it's what you had, and you didn't really have much else. And so you now have the largest affirmative action program in the world in India now, uh, largely because affirmative action started just after independence through caste-based preference. And so what has happened over time is that these provisions for affirmative action have expanded. And right now, 50% of seats in universities and 50% of jobs in public employment are determined through caste quotas rather than any kind of need-based assignments. So that's, that's where we are now. Okay. And so you have these groups, you have traditionally you had, or in starting in 1950, you had the scheduled castes, the scheduled tribes, and these were about a little less than a quarter of the population. They were recipients of affirmative action. Starting around 1990, this expanded hugely with another big category called the other backward classes. Together now, these make up 50%. But the question is, are you talking about one group or two group or three groups? You're talking about these very big categories. So you now have about, I'd say, there's 2,400 other backward classes. There's several hundred scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So you're talking about roughly 4,000 different social groups that are getting some kind of preference or the other. And it's very hard then to keep track of 
Is this at all need-based? How does it correlate with need? The interesting thing here, as Kale tried to link the politics and the, the underlying inequality in society, the very interesting thing here is that there have been big movements that demand disadvantage. So not only did we start off with basically group-based redistribution, the politics has then moved to further group-based redistribution. So in British India, whenever the word was used in a census, disadvantage, then different caste groups said, look, we're not really disadvantaged, you've got it wrong. Look at the way we live, look at the way we eat, look at who we marry, look at who we interact with. We're not disadvantaged. <clears throat> so that's a quote from the British census. And then two years ago, we've, you had a huge rally. This was one of the leaders uh, in Western India uh, who was really rebelling against, these are, this is the rally, these people were rebelling against uh, affirmative action. And the argument was, look, either include us, we're privileged, we know, but at the moment we can't get into schools and we can't get into colleges. So either privilege us or dismantle the whole system. So we're at this juncture where things are fairly explosive and we need equipment to help us think about what is fair in this very divided politically and somewhat socially, but certainly politically. We're at this juncture where we're trying to decide where to go. So one of the ways you can think about what has happened with affirmative action is to ask yourself, well, what happened within the groups that actually got affirmative action? So I said there were many, many groups. So these figures, I, I don't know whether they're, they're easy to interpret very quickly or not, but the two big categories that independence were the scheduled castes, which I've called SC, and the scheduled tribes, ST. So there are many, many groups, and the size of the the ball in each of these graphs reflects the size of the group, okay? Um, all right, so the left-hand graph looks at different Indian states, and the right graph looks at these different groups within the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, okay? And what do these graphs look at? They look at matriculation rates, so they look at completing secondary school in 1961, the fraction that completed, and the fraction that completed it in 2001. And the thing that jumps out at you, or I would hope eventually would jump out at you, is that two things seem to matter. One is where you were in 1961. So we have no semblance of convergence. If you were a scheduled caste and you were in a state that was poor, and the states that were poor were also poorer at providing public goods. If you were in a state that was poor, you've done worse over the 40-year period. Okay? The second graph tells you that if you were a group that was disadvantaged in terms of your outcomes in 1961, you remain severely disadvantaged in 2001. Okay? So you've had this spatial divergence, and you've also had this divergence within groups. Um, and so the question is, were, were these groups, when they were originally formed, you know, was it the case that I'm underplaying the importance of caste in British India, and there was this, I'm not saying caste was not important, it's vitally important. So if you want to get married today, and you want to search for a spouse, you will look at these marriage, you know, the equivalent of monster.com for the, for the marriage market in India, and there are many sites. And they will ask you, you can search by caste and you can search by subcaste. It's not that it's not important. So the question is really, something can be vitally important, like potatoes can be vitally important to the Nordic diet, but should they be important to social policy? And that's really the question that we have to ask. Um, so this is just, these are just quotes from a number of census commissioners, and they're out there to point out that people were ambivalent about caste. They were fascinated by caste in the British period, but they were ambivalent about caste. So in 1885, you had the first compendium of caste, and the person who did it described himself in a mighty maze without a plan. And then what happened is that in each census, you had instructions to collect data on caste, but very often people came back and said, well, we can't really figure out what people's caste is, okay? This, 
<coughs> this is data from the United States. And this I find absolutely fascinating because it's looking at the same individuals in 2000 and 2011. No, actually, it's, it, they, they go, the census is on the 10th year, right? So it's 2000 and 2010, sorry. I was getting mixed up between India and the US. Uh, so here what you're doing is you're looking at the same person. This is done by researchers within the Census Bureau. So you're looking at the same person and you're seeing whether they reported to be the same ethnicity and race in 2000 and 2010. And many millions of people, six million people, change their race or their Hispanic, Hispanic origin responses between those two years. They're looking at the same people. Who changes most? People of mixed parentage, people who are non-white Hispanic origin um, change more than non-white, non-Hispanics. Okay, so there's, there's patterns here. And so who reports what uh, is systematically changing over time? This is data from Brazil and there are two interesting things that have come up in Brazil. This particular study took the same set of respondents and it used the census form to ask them what their race was. And then it just had an open-ended question asking them what their race was. Okay? What do we find? We find that these categories are not that different for the whites. They're very different for what the Brazilian census recorded as mulatto. Okay? We also find that if you mention quotas, so since 2000, Brazil has a very large affirmative action program in its, in its public universities to correct for past discrimination. Okay? You find that if you mention quotas for blacks in Brazil, that doubles the fraction in that category in data. Okay? So this is just again asking how primitive are these categories that we're dealing with. Um, Okay, so I clearly don't have time. This is, this is some data in India. I don't have time for this uh, or this. Let me just end with why combining. So I'm out. Let me end with why combining uh, race and, and class matters because this is something um, that might come up later with Bertil. It came up with Kalle. It came up yesterday in um, James Goldbrett's talk. So this is from a paper I have with Rajiv Sethi in 2004. And what we do is we ask a very simple question. It's a, it's a purely theoretical model. And we ask, suppose everyone in the population would like some degree of inter integration. That's what their preferences are. So when do you actually find integration? And our answer is very simple. You'll only find it if income inequalities between the two groups are neither very large nor very small because that allows people then to live together. If income disparities are very large, then even though you want to live in mixed neighborhoods, you'll choose segregated neighborhoods for the sake of schools. Okay? If income disparities are very small, then historically being in one neighborhood will mean that it's a Nash equilibrium for segregation to continue, because when you're choosing to live in the other neighborhood, you'll be moving there in isolation. So even if everyone wants integration, you're not going to find it, and there's a role for public policy to get you there. So that's just an example of why you might really want to think about groups and classes together, and you might get more traction than thinking about inequality alone or thinking about groups alone. Um, so some scattered thoughts. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. You are, I mean, I have very, very disciplined speakers. They are following my signs, which means we have 10 minutes for questions. And you learned from somebody here, quick hand gets the first question. And I cannot see anyone, so you have to really wave. I, yeah, I see a hand. Another male hand, women, you want to speak up. Uh, you, uh, yes, uh, he needs a microphone. And then I have time for a woman after that. Please, people, remember. Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, good morning. Um, regarding the, the, the data, if we accept the data as it is, and we look to the graphs, more than divergence, what we are seeing is difference. And this links up a bit with the, what the former speech also, uh, speaker also uh, uh, discussed. And the problem is that uh, 
we acknowledge the difference, and we know the difference is there, but how can we change it? And, and that, that is a, a key issue. Um, particularly, uh, and, and being very, uh, very short, uh, the, um, for, for example, if we take the case of, of Scandinavian countries, they were already, uh, in history, for very long, they were already much uh, less hierarchical societies than others. Okay, so I'm going to ask you we, quick the question uh, yeah. so she has a, a time to respond. Is okay? it possible to actually go back to the slides a minute? Yeah. Is that too difficult? Because uh, I just have a picture to show you that might be, that might say more. Um, if not, then that's fine. It just would say what I want to say very quickly. And maybe we can collect the second question, Lisa, and then I can, I can answer them together. Yeah, okay. One more hand. Quick question. Oh, here we are. Okay. Okay. So, so let me just look at the slide. So should I do that? You, you just go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, here, is the, here is the slide that I actually didn't get to talk about. Because the question of what to do about it is very... Where did it go? Where did my Indian slide go? It was there somewhere. I had the slide which I said I can't. This one? No. Ah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so the question about doing something about this is really very hard. It has so, so there, I'll give you two responses. One is politically, what can we do? And in terms of social policy, what's the ideal thing to do? So one thing that's completely clear to me is states that manage to provide universal schooling of reasonable quality do better for all groups. So if you had to choose, if you had to be Rawlsian, behind the Rawlsian veil of ignorance, and you said, where do I want to live if I'm disadvantaged? You want to live in a place which has good schooling rather, in, rather than in a place where your particular group has power. That seems to matter more, okay? Politically, in terms of these inequalities within groups, so what the state of Bihar did, I'm coming back to the state Kale was talking about, what the state of Bihar did in 2007 is it said, look, this category of scheduled caste is too big because it's got people, the levels are very different. This is exactly what you were saying. Let's try to formulate policies that will cater to the most disadvantaged between, within these scheduled castes. And they picked this group, which is in turquoise there, the Musahars. Because if you looked at your education graph, they will be right at the bottom corner. So they created a new category called the Mahadalit. Within the Dalits, they said these are the people who really need help. What happened within two years is that all of the scheduled castes, except the one on the right, except that one in blue, wanted to be classified as Mahadalit. And they succeeded in being classified as Mahadalit. So the politics is extremely hard. The public good, the universal public good thing, is completely obvious uh, in the data. That works. Uh, making it work politically is very hard when once you're already in an unequal system. So this is very much what Kale was saying. Well, thank you so much. I don't think I saw another hand, but this, because you guys are so disciplined, I'm just going to give you a hand. Thank you. This means that we may have a chance for another round of questions at the end. So thank you so much.